<clears throat> so my topic today is on judge not, lest you be judged. When I first got this topic, I was really nervous but really excited because I was like, oh, we're going to do so much good. We're going to call everyone to repentance. We're going to read a bunch of scriptures. Everyone's going to feel guilty. <laughs> And then I was like, actually, no, I need this talk because, like, that's really judgmental. <laughs> um, I and I was having a hard time finding scriptures that kind of felt right for the talk. Um, so I went and I just kind of searched Judge Not <laughs> in the LDS Tools for Gospel Library app. Sorry. And I found the Judging Others. Um, section under topics and questions. So I just like to read a little bit of that for you. It says, sometimes people feel that it is wrong to judge others in any way. While it is true that we should not condemn others or judge them unrighteously, we need to make judgments of ideas, situations, and people throughout our lives. The Lord has given many commandments that we, that we cannot keep without making judgments. For example, he has said, Beware of false prophets, you shall know them by their fruits. And go ye out among the wicked. Um, we need to make judgments of people in many of our important decisions, such as choosing friends, voting for government leaders, and choosing a spouse. The Lord gave a warning to guide us in our judgment of others. Quote, With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. So that kind of brought me to repentance on my original um, attack on this topic, I guess, would be the word to say it, um, and made me think something a little bit different, which is that it's important to humble yourself before you judge another, or to make them aware of your judgment, which I don't recommend you doing, unless you're like the bishop, and they're asking for your opinion on that, but most of us aren't bishops, so don't do that. <laughs> Look for ways to improve um, finding the mouth in your own eye before trying to pass judgment on someone for not meeting your standard of righteousness, the beam in their eye. Don't be a hypocrite by judging others by the standards and commandments as you understand them. Remember that only Jesus Christ and only Father know a person's heart, experience, and understanding well enough to truly judge. We must lead and love others, walking with them towards Christ, not pulling them whichever way we see fit. Um, I know that's kind of difficult to do sometimes just because, you know, we see other people messing up and we're just all like, oh, like, that was something so easy not to do, but you don't know them. You don't know what they, their experience is. Um, one example that I could think of is um, back in the day, I'm just kidding, it was a couple years ago, um, I was struggling with church a little bit. It was during the pandemic, so like I wasn't able to go to church even like if I wasn't struggling. And um, I was with a lot of people that were like low-key addicted to coffee because that's kind of how people are. Um, and that was rough because I grew up with my dad who was a convert to the church and he was raised Catholic and Mexican. So like all of those things piled up to him really liking coffee. <laughs> And um, he raised us to obey the commandments and to not drink coffee, but he would drink it around us. <laughs> so I kind of picked up low-key really liking coffee. And so um, when I was taking care of him, a lot of the time I was trying to have to like literally drag his wheelchair away from the coffee section at Manco and stuff like that because he really wanted it. And Starbucks had just come out with their little frappuccino thingies which made it really convenient to not do what we're supposed to do. Anyways, so I used to be kind of harsh on him about that. But a couple of years ago, when I was going through my struggling, I realized that I wasn't doing the best I could do with obeying that commandment. And it would be really, really easy for others to see me like 
drinking coffee and be like, dang, look at Daniela, she sucks. <laughs> and they'd be right, low key, a little bit, right? Because I know that it was wrong to drink coffee. Like, that's not something that, like, Heavenly Father is going to, like, send down hellfire on you for, but it's a commandment that we've been given, and we need to put forth the grace to do that. Um, eventually, I was able to not do that anymore. I am a lot better at that. I haven't had coffee in forever, and the last time I did it was because they made my hot chocolate while I'm at Starbucks. <laughs> so, um, just remembering that your experience is not the same as another's, and it's not our job to judge them and tell them that they're wrong. Um, so another scripture that I found was, therefore, this is from Alma 41, 14, by the way. Therefore, my son, see that you are merciful unto your brethren, deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. And if you do all these things, then shall you receive your reward. Yea, ye shall have mercy restored unto you again. Ye shall have justice restored unto you again. Ye shall have a righteous judgment restored unto you again. And ye shall have good rewarded unto you again. It's a lot of unto you again. But that just goes to show how when we obey commandments, when we remember to see the good in another rather than to judge them for what we perceive as shortcomings, Blessings will just be compounded upon us. Um, I love that, and I believe that so much. Um, I look back on my life, and the times that I've been the happiest are when I was the most kind to others, and kind to myself as well, but mostly to others. Um, we're brought into this life, and one of the greatest things that we're called to do is to serve others. And how are we able to do that if we don't love them? How are we able to see what their needs are if we just look at their faults? Um, so I just wanted to really invite everyone to, when you think of others, when you think of people and how they just kind of maneuver in the world around them, try to look at them through a Christ-like view and try to think of how Heavenly Father sees them and remember that he loves them regardless of what they're doing with their lives and that we're asked to do the same um i just wanted to share this one last scripture from doctrine and covenants section 11 verse 12 it says now verily verily i say unto ye of thee put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good yea to do justly to walk humbly to judge righteously and this is my spirit I pray that we'll all be able to be more kind to others, to judge them as the Lord would, which is to love them, and that we'll all remember our purpose, which is to walk with each other towards Christ. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful experience it is to be able to speak during this background meeting. Um, I was very nervous to speak today. Uh, I love this topic that uh, we're speaking on, judge not. Um, being Christ-like means that um, we will extend grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, while I was studying for this uh, talk, I was reading through um, the New Testament and uh, in First and Second Timothy, um, it reminded me that uh, we are being edified. Um, this is especially important that we judge not and recognize that um, being Christ-like means that we are being patient and understanding that our conversion takes time and effort. Um, I know recently we've had a general conference, so um, I thought it was important to focus on um, how we can listen to the prophets. Uh, 
in a general conference talk by Elder L. Lionel Kendrick of the First Quorum of the Seventy. Um, he focuses on Christ-like communication. He says, Heavenly Father has given us a priceless gift in our capacity to communicate with each other. Our communications are at the core of our relationships with others. He mentions accountability. Um, accountability is self-awareness. Um, this is where we recognize that our actions and our words have an impact. We will be held accountable for all that we say. So as we're focusing on unchrist-like communication, um, maybe we're going to ask, what are examples of unchrist-like communication? There are four types. Anger, lying, blaming, and criticizing. This is important because we want to recognize that Satan um, can deceive us. And he um, has a spirit of deception and defiance. Um, and it is very serious that we recognize um, these examples and how they play a part in our life um, and how we can have self-control. We want to be willing to accept correction or chastening by the Lord. If you're thinking about what type of counsel you need or maybe you struggle with these issues, um, there is much counsel that are given to us by the prophets. Um, what Jesus Christ has counseled us to be is kind-hearted, um, kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. When we think of Christ-like communications, um, we want to communicate with each other in a manner in which the Savior would communicate. Christ-like communications are expressed in tones of love rather than loudness. Elder Kendrick continues and he says, these are intended to be helpful rather than hurtful. They tend to bind us together rather than to drive us apart. They tend to build rather than to belittle. Christ-like communications are expressions of affection and not anger, truth and not fabrication, compassion and not contention, respect and not ridicule, counsel and not criticism, correction and not condemnation. Judge not, brothers and sisters. When we are being Christ-like, we speak with clarity and not confusion. We attempt to be more tender. Um, I understand that sometimes we have challenges that we face with others, um, whether it's doubts or maybe even mistakes or shame that we're learning to um, move past. But as we listen to the prophets, as we prepare for the temple, um, as we continue to be better disciples of Jesus Christ, um, our Heavenly Father will bless us to be better peacemakers and better brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I'm so thankful for each of you and that I was able to uh, be here to speak today. Um, I hope that um, today that you think about how you can develop righteous relationships and ultimately return to our Heavenly Father. Um, I hope that you can treasure the gift of communication and use it wisely. Um, I'm so thankful to be here and to communicate this um, to you. And I say this in the loving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Our appreciation and thanks go to Denny and the town for their fine talks. Our concluding speaker will be Jaron Garcia. At the conclusion of Jaron's remarks, we will then close this meeting by singing hymn number 140, Did You Think to Pray? And after the closing hymn, the sister Mahalia Tahari will offer the benediction. Good job, Jaron. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, we got a little shorter attendance today, so the word probably got out that I'm speaking today, and if no one on the show, I'm just playing. But I uh, know it's a great opportunity to speak today. And uh, to th the topic I was uh, chose to talk about was the great apostasy and the restoration of the church. So it kind of brought me back to my missionary days because we got to teach those lessons and to help those learn about those truths and to learn where we got this church and how we are being led today by prophets and apostles. And uh, so I might jump around a little bit. I might get into that missionary mode to like just teach the lesson. So hopefully just bear with me and hopefully make sense through it all. But uh, the first thing I want to focus on is is um, the church from the beginning. And as we know, the church was created from the foundation of the world. It all started with Adam. He was the first prophet on earth, and he was teaching the truth of Jesus Christ. He um, taught his wife Eve and his posterity, and through all those times, all, during that period of time. And then another period of time, there's more prophets, like Noah, um, Moses, and all those wonderful prophets, even prophets in the Book of Mormon. And it shows that God truly loves us, and he truly cares. I uh, send those prophets to guide us and to lead us. And um, eventually, um, the, world, the world got really wicked. And it was actually during the time when Jesus Christ was on the earth. He was establishing his church and, and establishing the new law that all of us should follow. And he was teaching all these truths, how we should be baptized, how we should follow him, follow the commandments how we should run the church and all that. And um, eventually, the uh, wicked people did not want him anymore. He, he um, had to carry his cross and, and die on Calvary for all of us, which is an, an unfortunate event for sure. But as we know, he, he's living today, that he stands on the right hand of God and he grows from the tomb. So that's been the best, best gift and the best knowledge that um, I have received in my life that Jesus Christ, our Savior, lives to the, today, and that we still are able to follow Him through these teachings. And um, as we know, it's the, during the Great Apostasy, it was all over the world. Everyone um, had their own beliefs, pretty much. Like they didn't really know what was truth and all that, and and everyone just tried to do their own um, own perception of religion and all that. And there's actually a really cool scripture that I came across. Um, in the Old Testament, it's actually um, God speaking, and He testifies of this great apostasy. He talks about how there's going to be in a day and age where people will never follow Jesus Christ for a period of time, and it's in Amos eight, um, verse eleven and twelve. And this is what He says: Behold, the day come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north uh, even to the east, that, uh, that they shall run to, to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And during this period of time, I bet it would be really scary. I cannot imagine being in darkness, being in a place where you don't really know um, what the meaning of life is, or why we even are here um, facing life challenges and all that. And until one day, uh, most of us should know, or hopefully all of us should know, um, Joseph Smith, the first modern prophet to restore the Church of Jesus Christ. And I love his, um, and Joseph Smith's history as we read in the scriptures. Um, I love how he puts it, because uh, during his run up stage, he, his family was really religious. They all went to uh, different religions to test it out, like Methodist, all these different Christianity faiths. And 
And so Joe Smith was testing them all out. He really wants to know what was true and, and how come like this side says this thing, but on um, this side of town, this says the complete opposite of a Bible verse or a certain teaching. And so one day um, he was reading in, in the Bible in James 1 5, and he um, pretty much came across it. Talks about how if any of us like wisdom, that we should ask God. And so he was liking that wisdom. He didn't really know which pursuit. Um, to take in life for, for his religious practices. And so he really pondered deeply. And it's really cool how it talks about Joseph Smith history. He said that no other scripture had hit man that hard in that point of life. So it's really cool how powerful it hit him and how meaningful it was that he really, really, really wanted to find truth um, for himself and for his family and for, for the whole world, basically. And um, as he was preparing, um, I, I watched the. The restoration video a few like a few months ago and something that caught my attention because growing up like i was thought like oh he just prayed like he just felt it was the right thing to do to pray to god and ask for help on a certain topic but he spent weeks pondering about what to say to the lord what to um ask him like what what he needs to do and it's really cool how it explains that it, it's his first um prayer out loud to god this is his first time ever really trying to pray to God because before like he would just say uh, like prayers on the inside or just prayers for the meals but this is like his first time that he really wants to die, desire an answer and um, this is when the first vision happens where um, our Savior Jesus Christ and, and our Heavenly Father appear to Joseph Smith and, and he's only 14 uh, at this time and it's it's amazing to me how how God has that much trust and uh, all of his children, especially Joe Smith, because I don't know about you, but when I was 14, I, I was just a kid doing video games, just playing sports all day. I didn't really care <laughs> about religious stuff, but it's really cool how um, God knew that Joe Smith could, could do this for his life, that he can um, restore his church and to um, restore the truths that we have now today. And uh, it's kind of funny, I, um, I have a brother, he's uh, 14 right now. And um, if he came up to me and told me, like, oh, uh, I saw a vision of an angel or whatever, like, oh, stop talking, you're, you're just dreaming, <laughs> you're just uh, um, thinking about it, it's just imagination. But it's really cool, as I study more about the history of Joe Smith, that his family trusted him, that they were able to give him his full support. His parents, his uh, siblings were able there to support him to give them the guidance that they need, and eventually all of them were able to um, seek the truth and find out that it is true for them. And uh, his brother Hiram was there on his right hand side to assist in anything that he needed as the prophet at the time. And um, it's really cool that um, we're able to um, have that knowledge that Joseph Smith really did restore the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, if you're struggling or if you are um, not really know about Joseph Smith, I encourage you to um, study um, about like his history, Joseph Smith history. We can see that in the scriptures and study the Book of Mormon, because as we know, the Book of Mormon was translated by the prophet Joseph Smith through the power of God, and uh, that has helped me strengthen my testimony of Joseph Smith, because I was able to study it um, throughout my life, of course, but uh, study study it deeply on our mission because that's what we should teach out of and we help others come into Christ through the Book of Mormon. So that has definitely um, triggered my testimony that Joe Smith really did restore um, this church, that he really restored Christ's church on earth and that we have his power, the priesthood power restored. And that's the greatest, one of the greatest blessings that we have is to perform ordinances such as the sacrament that we took today to remember Jesus Christ. We can do baptisms, we can go to the temple, um, be sealed to our parents, to our family members for all time and eternity, and to, re to know about heaven and eternal life, that all these things that we do here at church and at the temple, it's, it's, it's going to last for all time and, et and eternity. And um, it's really cool that, um, that we have this knowledge, that we are able to be, be able to live in God's presence forever and have that opportunity. I'm so grateful for the chance that we get to go to, to the temple and to um, help those that have passed on 
because um, as we know, God loves all his children. He, he cares about every one of us deeply, and he wants um, people that have passed on, um, even our future families and people, all, all his children, to um, receive that, that witness of, of the true church and be able to have that fair chance to accept or reject the gospel. And so I'm so grateful for the opportunity as we uh, participate in church callings and in church service and temples that we're able to help those in need come closer to Christ because that's the ultimate goal um, nowadays is for us to gather Israel. As um, our prophet, President Nelson, has talked about, he, he talks about that gathering Israel is the most important thing taking, taking place here on earth. And, uh, and um, I love how, um, as we read in the scriptures, we know that this is the last time that the gospel will ever be on the earth. It will never be taken away again um, from the earth. So we're in the last days, as we know, um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're the last time period where, um, where, where Christ is going to come again. And as, we, as, a, as I was pondering about this talk, I was looking back at um, just general conference last week, and I love what President Nelson uh, was talking about um, earlier. Um, he, the title of the talk is The Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ Will Come Again. And to me, he focused a lot about the second coming, how we need to prepare now, we need to um, get ready to, to dedicate our lives to Jesus Christ, become true um, followers of, of him. And I love what he says. And here, let me pull it up real quick. He says, he promises that, um, he says, here's my promise to you, that every sincere seeker of Jesus Christ will find him in the temple. Uh, you, will, you will feel his mercy. You will, feel, you will find answers to your, your most vexing questions. You will better comprehend the joy of his gospel. And as I've been attending the temple, as we go as a ward and with my family, I've been able to feel the spirit there. The joy that comes through the temple is, is a, is, is a joy to me. I, there's no other place that compares to the temple. It brings me so much joy and peace, especially like with life now. I'm trying to um, go through school right now, trying to find a job, and just trying to figure out what I need to do in my life. And I've found out answers to my prayers as I try my best to live the gospel and attend the temple. That's, that, that's the key in my life that I've been able to, to help and to realize that God is always there and aware of me in my situation as I strive to attend the temple and to do my best each and every day. The God, or God doesn't expect us to um, be perfect, of course. He, he just wants us to try our best each and every day. He wants us to strive every single day. If we mess up uh, one day, he's always there to forgive us and to, and to pull us out from our misery or from our struggles in life. Really 
really an overloading for us as young adults, of course. We are trying to figure out what, what we want to do with our future plans, with our um, life goals, career paths, um, where to live at, everything. Everything is, is on our minds, I feel like. But as I put Jesus Christ first, I'm able to um, know with confidence that I'm, I'm going to be okay no matter what happens in my life. That I'm gonna, as long as I'm pushing forward, trying my best in schooling, trying my best to live my life, my life uh, like worthy, I'll be able to be blessed and be able to find the path I need to go on and to know where to find the good people in my life, to find those that can help me um, strive for my goals in life. And I'm so grateful for my Savior Jesus Christ and for um, this opportunity to speak with you all today. And um, um, before I close, I think I had a quote. Let me pull it up. Um, um, I, I heard this on my mission, actually. Um, as we read in the Bible, um, we know that um, when earth was created, every time God said it was good, each day he was like, oh, that's good. You've got the mountains here, it's good, it's good. But as he talks about his children, as we know, um, his work and his glory is to bring to pass um, the immortality of his children, so pretty much eternal life. And he calls us marvelous and great. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I think the earth is an amazing miracle by itself. But to compare that, God thinks it's just good, but he thinks us as, as we are great, that we mean deeply to him. And it, sh it just shows that he really cares about us. He knows our deepest struggles. He knows our thoughts. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And that's the greatest truth that I've learned through, through the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God truly does care about us, that we're able to come closer to him as we read the scriptures, read from the Book of Mormon, the Bible, from all these wonderful um, gifts and uh, resources that we have through prophets. I'm so grateful for the, the time that we have to have general conference last week and to listen to ordained people that God has called today to lead and guide us through these hard times and through all these struggles that we go through. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Father, we're thankful for this day and for all the messages that have been prepared for us. And please help us to be more like Thee and more like Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Please help us to be able to move forward with faith in our daily tasks and judgments and things that we must come to pass to do. And please help us to be able to be mindful of Thee and to keep Thee in Thy in our thoughts and our prayers, that Thou wilt guide us in those things that Thou would have us do. And please help us to be instruments in Thy hands, Father. And we thank Thee for the prayer of these many blessings that was given to us, and will continue to give us throughout our week and throughout our day. And we say these things in Thy name, Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have a number of uh, board announcements today. Before I give the board announcements, I'd like to turn some time over to Sister Williams for regional information. Hi, it's so great to be with you. Uh, my husband and I have been called as regional activity directors, and we're over the four single goal boards in the region. And we've been taking our time to go out and visit each one and get to know the young single adults. We helped put on the Wildwood Canyon uh, camp out for the three days in May, and that's coming up again, so mark your calendars for that. If you didn't have an opportunity to go to that, we hope that you will do it this year. Um, we work and talk directly with Elder Clark. He's the area authority, and we meet with him by Zoom. He calls us, and we are just so impressed about his love for the single adults. He will ask us very deep questions like, what are you doing to, to bring them together? What are you doing to help their lives? And so I just want you to know there's a lot of people that care about you, your bishopric, um, your area authority, your state president. So I'm just impressed how much the Lord loves all of us and is aware of us. Two of the big activities coming up, first of all, next Sunday at the Redland Steak Center, you have an opportunity to listen to a general authority coming from, from Salt Lake. His name is Elder Pingree, and he is bringing his wife. Just raise your hand if you've heard about this fireside that's happening. All right, well, we want everyone there. So hopefully by the time I'm done, all the hands will go up and say, I'm coming. Elder Pingree um, has this great desire to get out and meet the single adults. So the fireside's at the Redland Steak Center, that's right next to the temple. And if you want, if you like to eat, you can come at six. And there is like an, a meet and greet and food. And then the fireside starts at seven. And if you like to eat more, there's treats after. So they're just gonna get you when you come and when you leave. So they want everyone to have an opportunity to um, feel the spirit there. So that is next Sunday. And it, and I suggest if you want a really good seat, you know, get there early and you can get some food and get a good seat because they are hoping that they get over 600 single adults. And so they're, they're really, really gathering. They're inviting Orange County. They're inviting all, all uh, areas that are in this encompassing area. So um, you'll want to be there and, and listen to Elder Pink Green and his wife. Then the following Saturday, October 26th, is our Halloween activity. So that starts at 6 o'clock, and it is at the Rancho Cucamonga Steak Center. It's costume, so get those costumes out. Come impressing everybody. There is a costume contest for those that like prizes. We're going to have them. And so that starts at 6 o'clock. There will be a dinner. It is tacos, rice, beans, all kinds of good food, nachos. So you'll want to come to that at 6. And then the dance starts at 8. Now there will be at 7.30 the costume contest, a kind of a costume parade. So if you want your costume because you think it's like amazing, and you want people to see it, you'll want to be in that costume parade at 7.30. And then prizes will be given out and the dance will start at 8. And there will be snacks throughout the dance. So we're, we're going to feed you, make you happy. 
So those are the two big things coming up. So October 20th with Elder and Sister Pingree at, at the Redland State Center, and then October 26th at the um, Rancho Cucamonga building. All right, thanks so much. We hope to see you there. And you see us, come say hi. Thanks. And just some clarification, because you might hear some information that could be confusing. There are actually two firesides next Sunday. And so the one that Sister Williams talked about is the one that we are encouraging all the young single adults to attend. There is a secondary fire, not secondary, but another fireside here in this building that's called Lively, the San Bernardino Academy or San Bernardino Mission, has their fireside here, which we had a couple months ago. Uh, we've been given the assignment to set up chairs in the culture hall, 10 rows of chairs. So next week after our second hour, we'll dismiss, we'll set up the chairs. Um, but that's our involvement for the one here. So don't be confused when you hear about two different firesides. Don't be confused when you come to this one here because we really want you to go to the special fireside down at the Redlands Temple. And we'll be talking about that, getting a head count today in the second hour and also arranging carpools for anyone who doesn't have a ride down there. Okay. And um, we have family home evening this Wednesday, or this Monday night at 6.30. And we also have our award uh, ball festival in this building this coming Friday at 6 p.m., 6 to 11. But we encourage you to go to this one and the one on Saturday the ball festival. And I think that's all the announcements we need to we need to cover at this point. We'll we'll dismiss uh, briefly and then come back in the chapel for our Sunday school class. I'm sorry. Dismiss briefly, go to society and uh, 